See, I'm just gonna ride the wave until the morning sun. If I just speak into existence, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. If I just speak into existence, it's already done. Welcome to part two. Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund, a nonprofit 501c3, presents our podcast featuring inclusive voices. Welcome to our podcast called Educating Empathy. Thank you for joining us today. And gosh, we hope that you enjoy the journey with us. The first place my parents were able to secure housing was a duplex in the Central Hillside area. A wonderful neighbor lived above us. Sue was from Japan. She fell in love with me when I was born. Then my parents moved to another house on the Central Hillside. Sue moved a few houses down from us. And she became a dear and close friend to our family and babysat. She spoke Japanese to me from birth for a few years. I still remember a song she taught me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Because I don't know if I'm saying it right, but that's what I remember her teaching me. Like, you know, I don't know if the pronunciation is is spot on. Right. Who cares? It's so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I believe dad and one neighbor, Mrs. Priley, are the last remaining original neighbors from that time. Mrs. Lucille Priley, who goes by Lou. She is now in her 90s as well. She is a master gardener with one of the most beautiful yards I have seen. She and dad remain in contact from time to time. Her daughter, Carrie, was one of my main playmates and friends. We had meals and sleepovers at each other's homes, outings together. And during my childhood, there were kids to play with. Our next door neighbors, uh, the Heaths had eight children. So my brother, Bill, the neighbor kids, and I had a lot of fun. Some of our neighbors were family friends. It was, it was good. Hmm. Of course, we had strong ties and friendships with Black folks in Duluth. I have a special story to share. Hmm. In the early 70s, the NAACP invited Reverend Ralph Abernathy to Duluth. Wow. My mother attended the event although my dad did not because he wasn't feeling well. Later that evening, our friend, Reverend James Price, brought Reverend Abernathy to our home to have a late dinner because restaurants were closed. And even though my dad wasn't feeling well, he got up and fixed Reverend Abernathy a steak and baked potato dinner. Hmm. And Reverend Abernathy said it was the best steak dinner he ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and after eating, it was, it really was. After eating his meal, my dad brought him into our family room to rest. And I was sitting on, on the carpet there watching TV. And we chatted for a short time. And he was so sleepy. He fell asleep in my dad's lazy boy chair. Oh, And I I marvel because I knew he was an important man, that he had marched and worked closely with Dr. King. Wow. I also knew he had come to Duluth to help the NAACP regarding human and civil rights. Wow. Wow. It's incredible. It's just incredible. And that, and that he felt that safe and comfortable in your family's home to fall asleep yes. in that lazy boy. Yes, <laughs> as most people did who, who visited our, our home. That's so cool. And, you know, I want to circle back around for a moment to something that you and I were talking about recently. You gave an example in a classroom of another time when your mom was helping teach about racist actions or racist choices. 
uh, and some kids were saying something that was offensive to indigenous children. Do you want to share that story with us? Yes. Thanks. When um, my mom was teaching a first or first grade class, she said that there were some little boys and girls too, some children, I should say, who were doing that uh, uh, one little, two little, three little Indians, four little, five, you know, six little Indians, that, that song back in those days and doing that with their, putting the hand over their mouth going like that. Yes. And we, our family, we, oh no, uh-uh. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not happening. And so my mother, she thought, I, I'm, I'm definitely gonna be effective with these children in sharing this. And she said, you know what? That, that is really an unkind thing to sing. And you yes. may not realize it, but it's hurtful to people when you, when you sing that. And it's hurtful to, at the time they said Indian, to Indian children, mm -hmm. to Indian people for you to, to sing that. And she said, tell me how you would feel. Tell me how you would like it. If someone said, sang a song to you or about you and it said, one little, two little, three little white boys, four little, five little, six little white boys. Powerful. Or, or little white girls. And she said, and they, they just thought about it. And they said, I, I wouldn't like it. Yes. I wouldn't like that at all. And my mother said, that's how other people, that not other people, that's how people feel when you sing that song. Gosh. And she taught them about, you know, <laughs> She, wow. she taught them so well with wow. using that example. She did it in a gentle, kind way. And yes. also in a very, you know, just very firm and, and straightforth way. Yes. Yes. And they, and they got it. And yeah. so they had a great teacher. <laughs> yes. Oh goodness. Did they, I, I, gosh, I was, yeah, I was really blown away by that story because I thought, wow, how powerful, how simple, but powerful mm -hmm. that she could take a little song like that but 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 you know but say it the other way and be able to demonstrate that so effectively yes. it's if so it was so clever and so kind and so yeah just so loving and 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 a wonderful example of your mom my brother that's close to my age has indigenous roots oh wonderful Ojibwe. wonderful so we that's are and we have um indigenous roots as well but bill more so even Okay. And we, we just, nice. um, yeah, my family, we're very caring and loving and uh, not like any type of racism or, or prejudice. Yes. Yes. What, um, what indigenous roots do you all have? Uh, Navajo or what would it be? Cherokee from the South? I, for, I, I don't remember. Yes. I what, have it... to do the ancestry.com or one of those. I've okay. got to, I'm just so excited to, yeah. to do that. I've been putting it off, Wendy. Yes. But yes. I believe, I believe Cherokee is one of them. Okay. I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I might be, I, I apologize. I don't, there's another one and I'm just forgetting it from that area. Um, is it, is it, wait, Choctaw? Um, wait, no. Yes. Yes. That, there's is Choctaw. That okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that. Yeah. Um, because I think of the trail of tears uh, mm -hmm. coming from that area when they were taking everybody out of their land and homes. Uh, ja Jackson was pulling everybody out um, and so many people died along that way. And I feel like it was Cherokee and maybe Choctaw. Yes. And uh, I think I, I think I did mention that to you as well. And my parents did um, mentioned Choctaw as well. So I okay. should have added that. Yes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. It, um, wow. Okay. So, you know, you've been, wow. I, I, I'm still struck by the, by the spelling bee, by the, by the, you being a great speller. That's so wonderful. You know, thinking about you and school and your mom, uh, how, okay. So your mom retired, how old was she? You said that when she retired, she was 65. Okay. And my dad retired the same year. He was 60. Okay. Yes. Okay. In, in 1986. Okay. So yeah. Won wonderful. I and I was wondering um, then how long did your mom live until she passed? 
mom lived until she was about, it was about a month and a half before she was 86. Okay. She was, she was 85. And I bet mom would still be here today because of her eating habits. She, you know, was the type of person that yeah. drank, you know, two to three glasses of water and she <laughs> taught in the morning, you know, she taught me, she, she drank two glasses, right? She said to replenish and rehydrate, you know, she yes. was so healthy, yes. healthy eater. She yes. was a, she, she could walk out, walk me by far. <laughs> Even and as so, an older person? Yes, she oh, could goodness. outwalk me. Goodness. And so um, she would be 100 today because she turned 40 and had me four days later. Oh. So that that wretched Alzheimer's took oh. my mom. Dad oh. took care of her. Yes. yes. I, am and, so, I am so sorry that you lost your mom. Thank you, Lindy. Oh, gosh. I'm glad that she... Um, she, she was able to live with it for a long time after she was diagnosed, however. And that's tough. Um, mm-hmm. Alzheimer's is so tough. On it's people. so tough. The and on family of, oh, members. It really Sorry is. Yeah. Oh no. And, um, I'm glad it was before it was, you know, extremely advanced. She could still eat. She was still okay. able to swallow and eat, but, Good. Um, Good. yes. And she was such a, just loved I'm going to get spiritual. My mother okay. loved God so much. And she mm-hmm. was always uh, reading and um, beautiful. she's just a very spiritual, beautiful human being. Just yes. one, of, one of the best. Yes. I was, yes. I'm very blessed to, to have the yes. parents yes. that I did and do. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So even when, so even with her Alzheimer's, was she able to do some reading towards the end with her spiritual self or just um, praying that I, I, what I'm struck by when I think about that, you know, with her being such an amazing communicator, such a powerful educator and mother, uh, I, you know, and then a leader, you know, starting that other organization and the other work that she did, uh, I, you know, I'm struck by how hard that must have been to have a mom who could communicate, who had trouble with memory. Talk about that a little bit. Wow. Just what, you know? Yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's that's a big deal. Yeah. I knew that once she she wasn't able to communicate as she once did. Yeah. I know it affected her spirit. I know oh. it squelched her spirit. I bet. I bet. Oh, and it, and it was hard. It was hard on her. It was hard for us. Yeah. And this, this beautiful woman being taken by that. Yes. Rotten disease. Yes. And, um, I remember saying, mom, remember when you, when you used to plant tulips and even green onions and things Aww. all Aww. around the house and daffodils and yes. things. I said, oh, I just, I, I, I think of that in fond memories, mom. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me and she said, it's, it's too late for me. She said, it's too late for me too now. Late. It's too late for me to be able to do that. And I know yes. that wow. really, and she looked so sad because she wasn't able to do the things. So it just takes everything, yes. you know, for the vibrancy from a, from a person. Yes. It's just, Oh, it's really, it's really hard. It was hard oh. for her and hard. My dad took care of her. God bless you, dad. And, um, wow. And hard on us as a family. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. I can't Absolutely. wait to see her again. I miss yeah. you, mom. I love you. <laughs> oh, so, so precious. That's so precious. How, and that your dad took care of her is yes. just really beautiful. Mm-hmm. How many, how many years was that, that then that he took care of her? Oh, um, in, she passed in May of 07. So I would say in 99, December of 99, that's when the driving ended. That's when, okay. So that was, that was the last. Okay. Um, and so that's when it was more, more important to, to, so 2000, for, for like seven years. Okay. Um, to be more, you know, much more attentive and, and okay. paying much more attention. But she okay. was even, di- I think she was, yes, she was even diagnosed before that. And she thrived well. She just wow. thrived. Wow. And medications helped too. Okay. 
Okay. And lots of love for my dad and his delicious health, this delicious food and care. Yes. yes. And love from her family. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's a, that's a, it's just, it's such a huge example of love. It, it, it's not easy. I mean, there are, there are memory care places because most people can't, uh, can't handle the stress of caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. Yes. So it, it tr- yeah, it truly is. It truly is a beautiful act of love and, and commitment to, yes. uh, to somebody's partner and to somebody's mom. Yes. Um, yeah. Gosh. I, I commend you. I commend my dad so much. And yes. Wow. Grateful yeah. for him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my mom. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, it has to be so hard to have your mom not here because I, my, my dad passed in 2001, um, mm. fairly young, but my mom's still around and, right. and it, it's, I, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine what that would feel like because as special as our fathers are, um, yeah, we were in our mom's wombs and there's just something about, yeah, there's a, there's a safety with a mom and, and your mom was such a big, beautiful personality. Your father is as well. Uh, but your mom, I'm sure your mom just enveloped you even without putting yes. her arms around you. She just exuded that kind of, of, of love and, um, and nurturing being the kind of teacher, teacher person, person she was and the kind of mom she was. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. I bet that. Yes. I bet that's been and really And she had hard. to do most of the raising. Yes, it has. And she because dad was oh, on that's, the boat. Oh, know, that's most right. Of the time, um, his his boat. It would. He, we'd see him maybe if we were fortunate enough once a week for a few hours. Although, oh. yeah. And then the boat sure. would use icebreakers as long as it could. Okay. And then depending upon the uh, winter, if it was you know how warm or cold it was. Sure that when they no longer could use icebreakers, then that's when the boat would lay up for the winter. So once in a blue moon, we got to have dad for for Christmas, you know, to be there for Christmas. Oh gosh. Wait, sometimes you wouldn't get him for Christmas? No, no. Wow. Because they'd still be sailing. Sure. And, um, and then, but sometimes we would, and some, if it was a really cold winter, then we'd have dad a lot longer. So, uh, um, other than that, mom did much of the raising. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Because dad sacrificed so many years out there. Yes. And, you know, and, and gosh, when I think about that, you know, with that, that, that famous awful wreck, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, that was, you know, that was a pretty, that, that was a pretty harrowing job that he had as well to be on a ship and I bet you were all, uh, you know, worried or afraid for him, you know, being in those situations too. Do you remember any of that? Was your, yes. did your mom, okay. Oh, I'm did glad your, you asked, Wendy. Yeah. My, um, my mom used to take in the, in the summer, often would take a couple of weeks and go out on the, the boats just to be with my dad, to relax. Okay. And she would, she would sail, they sail through the oh, Great wow. Lakes, iron ore and taconite carriers. Sometimes wow. they would go to Canada for grain. Okay. And uh, and you, and you are and, and I'm going to get back to the to the tough part, but I wanted to share. I went mm-hmm. out there when I was 12 or 13. I should remember the exact date. And I was the parsley girl in the galley. I stayed a week. Are you serious? <laughs> and- wait, wait, wait! You went. You were on the ship for a week. Yes, mom and I went out. She was in the summer and she did her two weeks and I stayed for the first week. And okay. um, I was, it was just a, an amazing experience. And I was the parsley girl in the gal- in the galley. <laughs> wow. It, nice. so it was just my little tiny experience on there. It was sure. scary. I mean, you're just on this ship and the, I mean, Lake Superior is so Absolutely. huge and yes. I mean, probably thousands of feet deep and so cold. Um, yes, when the Edmund Fitzgerald um, sunk, oh my goodness, we had calls from all over and wanting to know, is that Matt? My dad's name is Matthew. Is that Matt's boat? Was that really? Matt's? Yes. Wow. And so it was so frightening and thank God it, it was not. However, one of the boats that my dad sailed on, they got it in for repairs just in time. Otherwise that would have happened to his boat. Oh my gosh. So, he, oh he my gosh. Sacrificed so many years of his life out there. Wendy. He did. He and did. he 
He has no, um, he has not had any desire to go on a cruise. He doesn't. <laughs> That's the last thing dad wants to do. Oh my God. <laughs> Stay I grounded. Bet. Oh, I bet. I bet. Because he had to have had, like I was saying, that or I was imagining some really harrowing passages. Yes. Oh, oh goodness. I can't even, I know, I can't even think about it through storms and those kinds of things. It yes. had to be just frightening. Yes. Yes. You're in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Now, did did he ever talk about stories where he had become sick? To, because I would imagine when people are on those kind of boats in tough situations, that a lot of people with pretty strong stomachs who wouldn't ordinarily be sick would probably become um, ill and nauseous and throw up. Did he talk about becoming sick often when he was on no. the ship? Or he? No, he oh, my, oh my gosh! No. So he was just either either he wasn't sharing. Uh, or, you know, or, or he really just was that amazingly hearty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, maybe he just became used both. to it. Yeah. Was that just same? became accustomed to it. Got yeah. used to it too. Yeah. Probably at first when he was um, in his, his late teens, when he went out there. Right. Perhaps. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, and you think about, you know, I think about how, oh gosh. I mean, if, if your father if your father were among a group of people who had been given so many more opportunities, uh, you know, he, you know, he, that was an amazing career for him, but he had to do a career like that because he was excluded um, from society in so many ways, like so many marginalized people, like so many um, blacks in our country. And so, um, you know, while he, like you said, he, he, he made great sacrifice to be able to support your family so that your family had that dual income by taking that kind of job uh, because that was the one that he could get, right? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, t I mean, help the listeners understand that piece too. That, I mean, I know from my doctoral study and just from other reading that I've done, you know, I, I know that, that opportunities were not plentiful in the same ways for minorities. Uh, do you want to talk about what your what your understanding of that history within your own family is? Uh, because again, I haven't walked that walk. So hearing it from you is just it, it, it's important because I want to learn more and I, I want to help the listeners be able to learn more too. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to. Thanks. I do want to say this. Um, there are a couple of resources that would be phenomenal for people okay. to read. And I've been, I've been he hesitant to post them because they're very long mm -hmm. reads and people would need to do it, you know, and there it's, you know, for with LinkedIn and things like that, it's just, everyone wants quick two minute right. read. And right. uh, this is read in your leisurely time. You okay. Know? Okay. Um, but, but yes, he, um, because of his, his, uh, lack of education mm -hmm. and having to work to to help support his family right he, his choices and options were limited yes and he was a he was a great worker and yeah when he did work as a as a young teen and teenager the people he worked for they saw that they saw that in him so he yes. was he was um he was fortunate in that way also uh my dad is lighter skinned okay. and we talk about that sometimes that maybe he might have had a little bit more grace yes. because he was lighter skinned you know back in those days uh, uh sadly and and even to you know sometimes today sadly that's that's how how it is and mm -hmm. i remember um my brother tony he, he graduated from high school in the 1960s and he said, and he, of course, experienced racism as well. And he said, mm -hmm. what they say is, if if you're, you're black, get back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're white, you're right. And that was the mentality of people. Wow. Yes. Wow. Say that again. That's so powerful. If you're black, get back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're white, you're right. Wow. Mm -hmm. And what year was that when he was saying well, that or relaying that? It was in the sixties and okay. and even in the even in the seventies, but it was more so for him in the sixties. Wow. As a as a teenager. And wow. my dad experienced, you know, that's that was his, you know, reality too back in those days. Um, yes. 
you know, people, uh, white, I think white people gave you a little bit, little bit more grace if you're the lighter your skin was. And that's wow. as sad as that is. Yes, so, it is. So, wow. And then he got an opportunity through um, one of his cousins. That's right. Who, who worked on okay. the boats. And he okay. said, Matt, there's an opportunity here. And dad said, this is my way up and out of poverty. Yes. This is it. And he yes. took it and worked yes. his way up. Um, a woman, uh, she's a Twin Cities person, Barb Summer, interviewed my dad, and I connected with her through someone, and she did an oral transcription for the St. Louis County Historical Society, and this was April of 2018. Wow. Yes. Oh, no. So cool. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask that if it's okay. I've been wanting to post that link so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. So people, there's lots of stories in there and uh, I would love yeah. to post that link on, on LinkedIn so people can. can... Wonderful. And then Wonderful. also Professor Chad Montre, mm -hmm. he is out of uh, Massachusetts. Let's see. He works at UMass Lowell. Okay. And uh, he is a professor of College of in the in of the history department. Okay. Uh, College of Fine Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and he interviewed my dad in uh, 20, 2018 or twenty nineteen. Okay. And wrote an article, and it's a it's a long one too. Lots of stories in there, and this is through. It's published with the Minnesota Historical Society. I've been wanting to put this one on LinkedIn too, just for Wonderful. Black History Month, and I didn't. But um, it says, this is summer of 2020, and my family and I are on the cover. It is from the 1960s, and it was a painting. And they, they you know how they, back in those days, they kind of touched it up with paint, mm -hmm. family portraits for some reason. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that is on the cover. And it says a Duluth struggle for racial integration. In, and then when you open up to, and you, this is online as well, to okay. look at the story, it's in that very Northern city, recovery and a forgotten struggle for racial integration in Duluth. Backing up, I want to make sure that the listeners understood this. And I want to understand this too. When you read from a book earlier um what was the name of that book what was that publication about you um that you and your mom were in yes. uh what was that yes. called connections and reflections mothers and daughters in their own light in their own words Catherine compton oh that's beautiful beautiful okay mm -hmm. i i do think you said that before but i just want i want people to hear that and then Aww. and then the title again about the one that i'm going to have you read from here can you say the title of this again and then who it's by yes thank you uh this the one is the minnesota historical society the minnesota history magazine summer of 2020 and my family is on the cover of the magazine it wow. says, a Duluth struggle for racial integration. And, and the story, the piece is called In That Very Northern City, Recovering a Forgotten Struggle for Racial Integration in Duluth, Chad Montre. And nice. um, gosh, it, it talks about, I mean, it, it starts at like, um, he talks about the following the lynching in Duluth of the three black circus workers um, in 1920 mm -hmm. and and just kind of goes on to talk about um, at the NAACP. My parents were, were very involved in the NAACP as well. Right. And then it just goes on to talk about um, it says it was not until the early 1960s that Duluth began to see any significant progress toward racial equality. This shift coincided with the arrival of a particularly outspoken African-American couple from Chicago, Matthew, Matt, and Helen Carter. A change in leadership of the NAACP chapter when local Black University lab superintendent William Moppins became president and the emergence of white Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Thomas L. Smith, 
as a bold advocate for civil rights. Working together, these individuals challenged the city's residential segregation by attempting to move the Carters into an all white neighborhood along the lakefront, starting with Smith acting as a straw purchaser to buy a lot and gaining momentum with Moppins invoking Minnesota's new fair housing law. Not surprisingly, white residents put up obstinate opposition from specious petitions at public zoning meetings to repeated acts of nighttime vandalism. In the end, however, the Carter family was permitted to build their house and eventually some neighbors even befriended the couple, including the man who had originally refused to sell his land to them. Yes, yes. Oh Oh my gosh, that is beautifully written. And what a capstone for what you have shared from your heart and from your experience as this child, as one of the children of this amazing couple, of this just trailblazing couple. Wow, I mean... Gosh, okay. I mean, it's just, it's a, it is, it's a wild ride. And for you again, to be who you are today, you are a hero. Your parents are heroes. Uh, everyone's a hero who has come through crushing oppression and exclusionary tactics that have been so insidious and, and soul crushing or or supposedly soul crushing. But look, but look at how, how this has not, this has not happened for you and your family. You you've persevered, and you you still have these beautiful souls and hearts. I, I'm I'm blown away. I mean, I'm just it, it's such an honor. Thank you. To, I appreciate. It. Gosh, yes. Thank Didn't you. Mean I mean, oh no, interrupt all you want. Like you said, we're having a conversation, <laughs> and and just you know respecting each other. I I mean, I'm just I, I'm really I'm really blown away. And and I have to say this. Uh, when I hear you read. When I hear you communicate, dear Kay Carter, oh my goodness, you are, you're a scholar as well. Uh, you may not you may not recognize that in yourself, but boy, are you? <laughs> and <laughs> and and I, you know, I hear that, you know, you know, my friend, I hear that in you. I hear that you are this eloquent scholar of a person, I, I guess I would like to encourage you to think about more education, uh, not because you need any more education to be any more bright than you already are, uh, but so that you can uh, continue to serve. I just, I want to plant that seed. I feel, I, I feel like I'm supposed to say that. Uh, it just feels like it was put on my heart when I was listening to just the brilliance of you. I don't, and I don't know if you under, I don't know if you recognize that in yourself, but you, you are really quite brilliant and, you know, not just passionate, but, but, you know, just, yeah, quite brilliant, highly intelligent. Yes. You are your, you are your mother's child. (laughs) You are. Gosh. Yeah. You know what? This is, this is so interesting. Mom decided to get her master's degree Mm -hmm. when she was in her early 60s just a few years before she retired we were she was an empty nester really she thought I she did it for herself and she she did it for of course you know retirement um, sure as well to to be more plentiful yes she wanted to do it for herself and she did it at UMD she went to UMD and finished while she was teaching full-time still that is fantastic. Mm-hmm. See, I love that about th- that's what's so fascinating about these interviews and uh, and these uh, experiences, this journey that I get to have with the podcast with my with my dear friends. I, I find out things that I didn't know, uh, and then I and then I I get to just come along on the journey with the listener too. This is fantastic. Uh, I I love that, and I, I I that sure resonates with me because once my son Connor went off to college, I went I went back to school, and and I did my master's, and then and then went on to do the doctoral work. Uh, but yeah, I uh, mm-hmm. I know that you know I know that you know that you are a parent and. Uh, yeah, uh, single mom, single parent. So have, single mom. yes, yes, single mom, and you have a lot of responsibility. And I, I, boy, do I respect, um, I respect that, 
I respect that deeply. And I'm, I'm saying that again, just because as I say, boy, I do this. I don't, you know how that awful word was used in the wrong ways, like in the past. That's why I'm going to like say it again. So I'm going to say, I absolutely respect that. <laughs> So, Aww. you know, because that word, you know, there's, oh, and you know, I will have to say um, for the listeners, you may or may not have heard um, the word in its entirety that, that Kay had said at a certain point, because I will have to make a decision with our editors and with our nonprofit about uh, whether or not we, we keep a certain word in. Uh, so you may have not heard a very offensive word. You might've heard just the beginning or we might've bleeped something out. Uh, but the reason Kay chose to say it uh, was because it was written on her house and, and on her sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was, she was reading from a publication uh, using that word. And because she's a Black woman, she can, she can use that word. It is appropriate for people uh, from her culture to be able to do that. It is just not acceptable uh, for me or for people who haven't lived what she's lived uh, to use it. But I did want to let the listeners know that we will, um, you know, that either you will have heard it uh, and there's a, there was a reason we kept it, or we've chosen to bleep that out, but know that, you know, she was talking about a very um, awful offensive word when it is used as, um, as, as a way to put down uh, people and to hold power over people, to hold white power over people. And um, when it comes from uh, whites or people of, of power uh, over blacks. Um, gosh, this is just, this is an incredible conversation. I am just going to uh, look really quick on my little list. Uh, uh, a couple things to add. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, you, I just, I love this ride. You are <laughs> such a wonderful communicator oh. and it's oh, just, oh, it's fantastic. This is and wonderful. I've just been a little, thank you. And I've been a little embarrassed you. because I started, I've just been kind of fighting a little cold, which I haven't mm -hmm. been sick in so long. And so my voice is a little, a little uh, low, extra low today. And I, sure. I'm not happy about that, but that's okay. I'm just yes. going to keep on going. Yes. Yes. And I'm so grateful to you uh, for doing this interview uh, with me um, and for the benefit of others having, you know, not feeling quite well. You and I had a conversation about this this morning and I, mm -hmm. I, I, I hoped that with tea and different things you would be able to. And, and I'm so grateful that you that you felt like you could. So thank you. And thank you for sharing with the listeners that that your voice is a little different than it usually is. Yes. Uh, I, I think I want. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I think I want to to sort of end things on how, as a parent, uh, did the parenting of your parents influence you? Uh, as a parent now, what do you see that uh, resonates from your own childhood or or the parenting that you had the benefit of when you grew up? Does that, I guess, I don't know, is that too long of a question? No. Okay. I got it. Oh, thank you. My parents just, they're just really care and cared about good manners, mm -hmm. doing the right thing, mm -hmm. being a, a, a person of your word, um, honest person, uh, just I mean, you know, really good morals and, and values in, in, in terms of just being, wanting us to, to care about other people. My parents, oh my gosh, they they cared about, I forget, there's so much more, Wendy. Anyway, they cared sure. about the underdog, so to speak. Yes. Uh, we always, they, they took people in um, yes. and cared for people that um, other people may have shunned. Sure. They, they, they were friends with, there was a... a a brilliant man who was just a brilliant pianist and he was a piano teacher. He was mm -hmm. also a writer and um, he experienced so much racism as a man who was gay in Duluth, a black mm -hmm. man as well. Mm -hmm. And we loved on him. Um, yes. Aww. My, my, you know, and my dad uh, sailed on the boat with, one of our, our, who became a very dear friend of ours, who was also gay, and uh -huh. he's one of the most brilliant men. I mean, he was a valedictorian Wonderful. in his high school and his college. Right. Um, nice. 
just, you know, they, they cared about others. And yes, um, I had a, a, a foster brother from Uganda that we, uh, who lived with us, that we loved, who was closer to my oldest brother's age. And they were, they were oh, wow. friends, but I just, we just, yeah, they are good people. Yes. And I, I can't, they're just like, like I said, champions for human and civil rights yes. and standing up for them. Yes. Um, in a nonviolent, peaceful way. Yes. Full of love and, yes. and care for others. And, yes. and my mother was big on manners. So that's important to me. So I grew up with a heart filled with love, not hate. Yes. And I could, and I thought of it, I thought, man, I could easily be this person who's so bitter and full of hate for all the yeah. stuff that I'd gone through. And as a, Absolutely. a person in this society, continue to go through, you know, yes. when, you, when you go to the store, we talk about that, you know, thinking I'm, as a, as a black person and many, many folks, brown and black people can, can relate to this, thinking that you're going to steal and watching you. And it's just like, really? So, um, but they, they, I have passed on these wonderful qualities to my child. Mm -hmm. and uh she people often say oh my gosh she has the best manner she's so sweet and kind oh. her teachers love her her friends parents do right um and I know that's from what I have in, uh, helped to instill in her and she's a great person on her own mm -hmm. and then from what my parents instilled in me yes Yes. And I, and I know she will pass that on to hers. Yes. Yes. I want to, I want to back up for a second about something that you just said, because, you know, those of us who have white privilege don't have to experience this. You said that as a black woman, when you go into a store, you, you can be, you can be, you can be assumed, it can be assumed that you're stealing or you may steal because you're a black woman. Talk, talk, explain that to listeners who who just who haven't grown up as a minority and who don't understand that. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Tell me, mm -hmm. say more about that for us. Yes. So what it's like for you? Just, I'm going to give you two examples. Mm -hmm. Just as um, checking out in the self checkout, mm -hmm. I can. I, I I just you just have to and most of most brown and black people many of us know that mm -hmm. there's just you can't have I don't, I can't explain it you want to make sure you're doing one item at a time and you're when you're scanning it and you're just you're being very deliberate about your movement because oh, wow you're, you're you're being and I you know you're being watched wow and it's you know is that person going to steal and um wow. it, it, it happens a lot wow and 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 there could be um, let's say a white woman next to me and she can bring her cart in a, a different position close to where her bag is. She can have a whole bunch of stuff in her hand. Um, I mean, and just, I can't explain it. And I just look at her and I think she doesn't have any idea how privileged she is. Yes. That she can just, I mean, she's not being looked at probably as a, yes. uh, you know, it's skepticism, or in a yes. certain way. Yes. And oh, oh, a friend of mine and I, this was a couple of years ago, we were in a store and we were looking at earmuffs. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, or or uh, some kind of some kind of winter hat. That's mm -hmm. what it was, a winter hat. Mm -hmm. And she pulled out her earmuffs out of her pocket and and said, Did you know, did you want to get them something like this, like this? And I said, you know what? I said, and then she put them back in her pocket. I said, oh my gosh. I said, can, I have to tell you, if I did that, it would be a problem. Yes. I, if I took them out, because yes. they would be thinking I was stealing. And the last example, and she's, and that, that brought great awareness to her. She was right. like, she didn't, she's like, I didn't, wouldn't have never, not even thought of that. Yes. I, so she's more aware now of things like that. Yes. And one time I, in the same store, I'm going to leave it. I won't say it. And um, I, I bought a, a, a print uh, mm -hmm. that you can you can frame and hang on the wall. And I decided not to keep it. So I brought it in a big, a large bag just mm -hmm. to keep it uh, from bending. Mm -hmm. And when I brought it to customer service to return it, I um, I had my my big bag. And, it, and uh, it was a bag that I bought from Costco, the one that you can put cool and hot things in. And um, I said, 
I just have a couple of things to get. And I said, I suppose I said, but it's going to be a problem, isn't it? With me, with this, with this bag, she goes, yeah, I know it is. I'm sorry. She goes, why don't you just take a cart? Wow. That was about a year and a half ago. So to this day, I still, as a good person, doesn't steal. Yes. uh, Yes. Just a human being trying to shop. I looked at as, as someone who may potentially steal. Yes. All the time. Yes. Yes. All, most of us deal with yes. this every day. Yes. Yes. And, and can I ask this? And is that, that's the case in either professional attire or casual attire, correct? Correct. Yeah. That's more what casual, I, but, okay. but probably professional too. Yes. But I would say more definitely. Professional. Yes. Yes. And, and, and there's no excuse for either, but, but that blows my Good mind point. too, because I, I have, I have heard, I've heard that, that in both cases, um, from people I know that that's, that's been an experience. I thank you for, thank you for sharing that because it's so true that those of us in, in white privilege, you know, we don't walk that walk. And so we don't even, we, we don't even know all of these insidious, um, cumulative kinds of messages uh, that are being sent to our friends, colleagues, and and our what I've talked to you about our brothers and sisters in our human family, what they go through, uh, that wears a person down because there's so many messages that that say you're not a value or you're not worthy, and and it's you know it's not right and it's and it's not true. Uh, you and I, you and I've talked as friends about that we're one human family. Uh, I think I said that earlier on this um, on this podcast too. That that's you know we have that shared value, uh, and and we really feel that you know that that everyone should have that shared value. Can you talk just a little bit with me and with our listeners about so as a black woman right now? Um, you know, you're talking about how, you know, that happened now where you're still, you can still be looked at, you know, as, as a potential, you know, thief, if you're in a, a you know, a, a store, which is just appalling uh, and would be so stressful and just, and, and just demoralizing. Um, but speak, if you could, please, about this time in relation to, you know, George Floyd was killed. Uh, Minnesota is not the Minnesota nice for every every person in our state. That was made pretty clear to all of us uh, when that awful murder took place. And then I will tell you, you know, teaching in inner city schools too, I I I, I noticed things that that I was, you know, I was really saddened by. Uh, but but as a black woman, tell tell our listeners, or please share with our listeners, what does it feel like for you right now in the country with the kind of um, racial climate uh, or, you know, you know, things that are happening, you know, with voters, you know, just voter suppression, you know, different things, just, sorry, I, long question, but, but how are you feeling? Tell us where you're at with all of that and, and how are you coping with all of this? Mm-hmm. Well, I tell you, it just wears you down. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of it is wearing all of us down. Although I remember a woman, this will help explain that question, Wendy. Okay. okay. A woman I once, once worked with, mm-hmm. um, I worked at uh, City Hall uh, and, and she told me, she said, everybody has stress. She said, but black people, and I'm going to say black and brown. Mm-hmm. You just have a different kind of stress. Absolutely. Yeah. Different because yeah. of the things that we deal with on a yes. daily basis. Yes. That say white people in this country, mm-hmm. most white people, many white people do not have to deal with. Yes. And yes. it's, 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 you try, you just do your best to, you know, you have to ignore some of it. You have to just take in what you can. Yes. And um, I, I, I'm very saddened by the, the division yeah. and the hate yes. that has really um, been more just, 
in your face, um, yes. even more so over the last few years. And it's, yes. it's the, the climate. I mean, I don't understand it. Instead of like what, what you're talking about, Wendy, the, mm-hmm. you know, unity mm-hmm. and love, mm-hmm. one human mm-hmm. family, instead mm-hmm. of us gravitating more together to gain an understanding yes. and to help empower each other. Yes. 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 That's the effectiveness of being human beings sharing one earth. That's how we're effective. It's it's staying in this realm of love and sharing, not yes. hierarchical control and exclusionary kinds of practices. It's helping one another. Exactly what you were sharing about your family. Your family helped everyone. And they and they helped the they helped the city of Duluth grow into a more loving space. Uh, you know, with the, that man having a 360 degree you know, turnaround, uh, who didn't, you know, didn't want you to have the land and didn't want you to be in that area. It's so beautiful to think about that. And and just, yeah. Yeah. And it's when an example. You, yeah. Sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, I, just, fine. I was taking in what you said and it was making me emotional. Yeah. Because my dad yeah. is one of the last living residents of the, of those in those, from those days. I think he's probably the, he's the last one. I, I don't know if there are any others still living. If there are, there are, there are very few, most died or moved away. But wow. yeah, he's, he's, he's going to be moving this year. He's, it's time to sell the house, but he, he is, um, he's one of the last. Oh, goodness. There. That you and have to, that has to be emotional for you. It is. And it we're is. hoping whoever buys it, buys it. Yeah. However, there's a lot of people that have expressed, boy, wouldn't it be with the history of that house it would be marvelous to have someone who buys it, who really respects and cares about that. History. Yes. I, you know, I thought about that very thing and I thought, oh, it should be an amazing black family or maybe an indigenous family or, or any, any family that, feels um that they belong in or that that they're part of a marginalized um group um yeah or you know what or like you said anyone i mean it it could be a beautiful white family who absolutely honors every everybody in their human family too who really respects it yeah so like you said it could be it could be anyone but one who respects the history i get that yeah yeah i think we said you know, you said it beautifully that, you know, <laughs> I went straight to it. it needs to be a black family, but you know, or indigenous family, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I can, I, yeah, I, I just I can imagine it would be, it would be really hard for you. Um, like you were sharing so eloquently um, as far as the, you know, the division of the times and, and, you know, some things that feel like um, there's backlash um, with, you know, progress made, uh, but from what I have studied and what um, some black male scholars who I respect so greatly have shared with me, um, when it is so true that when we are on like a precipice of of amazing change um, and um, and that there's a shift happening, uh, there is sort of a last ditch effort at all costs to try to do anything. Um, to not to not see that change happen, but it's it's among us right now. I mean, we um, there. I personally feel like there, and I think the numbers bear this out. There are more people who who do uh, aspire to the notion of one human family, and or or not even aspire to it are already there. Who really see each other as as part of their family and feel a responsibility to love and care for everyone. And, you know, and minority voices are quickly becoming um, majority, which is wonderful because we are this beautiful melting pot in this country and only together are we strong. And yeah, and I, I just, I think, I think it's just an example of, of, of just uh, people who, who are like what you and I were talking about, I was saying that like, if I could use a visual, you know, instead of flying in an airplane of, that would represent humanity into the straight into the ground by being divisive and not working together. Um, instead, when we come together, uh, we can, we can stay airborne. We can stay flying with love and kindness and, and 
being sustainable as human beings and one earth. Anyway, I get kind of deep. Sorry, I get on my soapbox, but um, yeah, just, you know, you and I are, we, we have, we have such similar values. And I, Mm -hmm. I think, I think, yeah, we just do. And I, I, my hope is with the podcast that as I have conversations with people who are dear to me, it helps others to come along. Well, not others. I hate that word. It helps people to come along, our human family to come along with us on the journey of, of, of discovery within our conversations uh, to help people uh, be able to have the empathy uh, to, to try to understand the plight of, of one person from their human family, right? To, um, you know, I've shared this before mm-hmm. that I think empathy, I think empathy can become, be a bridge for greater understanding because I think it bridges us, you know, so that we can have the bridge to get closer so that we can lean in. And I think when then when we can lean in through hearts and minds of empathy, and you know, the podcast is called Educating Empathy, because we believe at our nonprofit, Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund, that, you know, empathy is a piece of helping in the area of encouraging racial equality or connection with everybody, and not just racial equality, uh, equity for everyone, do you know, mm-hmm. with, um, That's with, right. Right with with an acceptance of 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 every every group, uh, it, regardless of you know what the you know what the area is, right? Um, yes. Not just racial equality, but every human being. Uh, yeah. So, but I but again, I think empathy is that bridge to greater understanding. Helps us lean in to be able to to pay attention, and when we lean in to pay attention, we see the similarities. Um, among ourselves with our members of our human family. But then I also think it gives this beautiful opportunity to hear the details uh, that are unique to that individual, right? Mm -hmm. So empathy, lean in, uh, be able to recognize the similarities, but then also respect and honor the details that are unique, that we haven't walked, right? Uh, that we can respect, we can have empathy about, but truly we can never understand the plight of another because we haven't walked that walk, okay? Yeah, but I do think empathy helps. I think empathy is like a conduit. And absolutely, is that that a good way of describing it? How would you describe empathy? Empathy is even if you haven't walked in that person's shoes or, or had those experiences, right? To really listen to yes. what their experience is. Yes. And and to honor that experience. Yes. And appreciate it. Absolutely. And empathy, I also believe, is caring. Agreed. Agreed. Caring yeah. And extending kindness mm-hmm. and love and mm-hmm. just a desire. And, it, and maybe some people might think, oh, she's saying, well, that's too much for me. Well, that's fine. Then, then just a desire to, to gain an understanding about people. That's beautiful. That's beautifully said. Absolutely beautifully said. I think that's a good place to, uh, to end because I wholeheartedly agree uh, with everything that you just said. Thank you so much. Gosh. Okay. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much. Mm, this is incredible. I I appreciate your courage that you and your family had in impossible circumstances, uh, terrifying circumstances in Duluth, and the courage you know in this day and age uh, as as a black woman in Minnesota, as a black woman in our country and in our world, to still choose love and empathy and and hope. Uh, and then I also thank you for the courage to share today, because it takes a lot of strength to be able to revisit, you know, uh, the tough things that you had to talk about. And you were able to do it with such amazing composure, which is unbelievable and impressive. And I'm just, I'm so grateful. And I'm just such, I'm in such awe about that. Um, and then for the times that you were so authentic and so honest um, with, you know, being overcome with emotion, I really appreciate you taking this journey with us. Oh, it was my pleasure. 
it was such an honor. I appreciate you asking me and, and I love being a part of this journey with you and your wonderful organization. And, um, and it's all about us learning, learning about one another and helping Indeed. each other. Oh, it's, so it's all about human family, one human family. So well, it's so well said. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Wendy. much, Kay. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for coming along on this journey through a conversation that we had today. Uh, sometimes our podcast will have part one and part two. Uh, that will happen oftentimes. Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund's Educating Empathy podcast is available to you all. As we say goodbye, we want to share that we hope that you are well. So we say be well, and we send our love and our empathy. Until next time.